felt a connection to the natural world, to the living, breathing ecosystems that sustain us. Even as a child, I could never really understand how people so easily feel a connection to each other, but not to the water, air, and food that literally fuel every cell in our bodies. Water. This simple molecule makes up 60% of our bodies. Without it, we would die in a matter of days. I remember being amazed by the idea that the same molecules of water floating around my classroom could have come from the river that my family walked through when they first arrived in Canada, or from the water that dinosaurs used to drink. That's a version that my son especially loves. But when we think about the importance of our environment, we're really just scratching the surface if we limit ourselves to water, air, and food and how they make it possible for us to live. We need to take a step back and consider the ecosystems and how they are interconnected and supporting each other constantly, making it possible for us to thrive. Growing up, I saw how the, how the environment shapes our health and our well-being. I spent every break from school tucked away in rural Nova Scotia. We spent our days exploring long forgotten dirt roads, splashing in rivers, picking berries, and occasionally running full speed from a cow that had a bit of a temper. For me, being immersed in nature meant feeling a connection to it. I still remember the summer we had to drive to a spring to get water because our well had dried up. This didn't last for a very long time because nature is resilient and it's often quite good at adapting and restoring balance, but it taught me a lesson. It taught me the importance of environmental stewardship, of responsibly using and protecting our environment through conservation and sustainable practices. Too often, we've forgotten this responsibility and we take too much. I grew up in Nova Scotia during the collapse of the Atlantic cod fisheries. For thousands of years, fishing had sustained populations. Communities were built around fishing ports. It wasn't just a job. It was a tradition, a proud part of our history and our culture. But we began taking too much. Overfishing became the norm. Fish hauls doubled in the 1960s, then they tripled leading to a crash in 1992. This forced the federal government to do something that was once unthinkable, to issue a moratorium on cod fishing. Fishermen called it the biggest layoff in Canadian history. You couldn't walk into a restaurant or watch the news without hearing and feeling the concern. For these communities that started as fishing villages, how would they continue to exist with no job opportunities for the next generation? We are now 25 years into this moratorium and stocks still have not recovered. Due to the many contributing factors that led to the fisheries collapse, some argue they will never recover. The most frustrating thing about the fisheries collapse, and I know a public health audience will understand this, is that it was preventable. For years, there had been signs that things were not okay. The collapse did not come as a surprise to those who worked in the fisheries or who studied fish ecosystems. It was even less surprising to our indigenous neighbors. In many ways, my commitment to environmental stewardship has grown from these early experiences. They're also what sparked my interest in environmental epidemiology, in understanding how the health and disease of human populations can be shaped by our environment. At the individual level, when we talk about a person's health and well-being, we often think about balance. Whether it's water and vitamin intakes or the microbial communities that live throughout our bodies, optimal health means finding the right balance. And this is something that we, we do a good job at recognizing in public health. What's often missing is the extension of this concept beyond the individual to the ecological level. We imagine that a division exists, that we are somehow separate from our environment, when in truth, we are linked. And optimal health is not just about balance within individuals. 
It's also about achieving balance between us and our environment. We currently have an enormous amount of evidence demonstrating how our health is linked to the environment. As an environmental epidemiologist, it can be hard to keep up with. Premature mortality, stroke, heart disease, injuries, cancer, respiratory and gastrointestinal diseases, premature birth, fertility, even our genetic expression, epigenetics, have all been linked to the environment. The World Health Organization has estimated that 13% of all disease in Canada may be due to environmental factors. We are at our best when we are in balance with the environment. And this balance can only be achieved through care, respect, and stewardship. Never has this topic been more important than today, when we're currently facing unprecedented environmental crises. We are currently living at a time when human activity is the dominant influence on the planet's climate and environment. This is formally known as the Anthropocene. This period is not just defined by our influence on climate change, but it also includes things like species extinctions and loss of biodiversity. And we're not just talking about plants. It was recently estimated that in the last 50 years, our planet has lost 60% of its wildlife populations. These concerns are not new. The first warnings of climate change came during the 19th century. Years later, an article from 1912 argued that the global use of coal was resulting in 7 billion tons of carbon dioxide emissions each year and that these emissions would, in essence, create a blanket that would soon begin warming the Earth. A hundred years later, we know exactly what this warming looks like because we see the news headlines every day. Heat waves, ice storms, vector-borne diseases, forest fires. We now see wildfires in the Arctic. But this is not a time to despair. It is actually a time of hope and of great opportunity. The field of environmental epidemiology shifted recently. We went from solely studying diseases to studying health. And we began to examine all of the ways our environment can improve our physical and mental health. This new empirical knowledge in many ways complements traditional indigenous knowledge, knowledge that has always stressed the importance of our connection with the environment. Knowledge that has always said, water is life. By understanding our connection to the environment through this more holistic lens, we're starting to embrace new and innovative ideas to help us address our imbalance, to help us restore balance with the environment. One idea was the Rights of Nature legal movement. It began only a decade ago, but has already had incredible success in granting legal rights, a form of legal personhood, to nature, in particular water. And that is just one example. I know it's daunting. It can seem hard in a world where we're constantly kind of surrounded by information and rarely have a peaceful moment to ourselves it can seem hard to make time for environmental stewardship in our daily lives. But the rights of nature movement started with one person's idea. Because one person can make a difference. And as adults, we can set a tone for the next generation. I often call myself an environmentalist. But the truth is, I am far from perfect when it comes to environmental stewardship. I do my best to remember my reusable shopping bag and my coffee cup. I choose to support local farmers who use organic practices. And I use my, my mobile phone app when I'm not sure what goes in my blue bin. The truth is there are so many things that we can do each and every day. The list is seemingly endless. But what that means is that there really is something for everyone. You just need to decide what works best for you. I believe everyone in this room is already an environmental steward. For me, the biggest individual level, level impact that I probably have is how I am raising my son. 
When I talk to him about how the environment is connected to our health, it's not just about how a tree gives us clean air. We talk about the entire system. The shade provided by the canopy, the habitat provided for animals, the complex root system and how it protects the ground from erosion and flooding. We step back and see the whole picture. The clarity with which we are beginning to understand our relationship to the environment is slowly seeping into classrooms and it's changing the way children are learning about their world. I learned about the three R's as a child, reduce, reuse, recycle. My son learns about protecting our natural resources. He taught me about water walkers, indigenous women and children who walk to protect the water for all. Today, children are being taught to identify the complex ways that we interact with our environment. And these children who learn today will lead tomorrow. I believe they will take on the environmental challenges our world is currently facing and build solutions that respect our living, breathing ecosystems that sustain us. So let me leave with one question. What type of world do you hope to leave for future generations? Personally, I hope to leave a world where all children feel a connection to the environment and grow to be champions of environmental stewardship. Thank you.